The distance between genes can be mapped in a sense, a relative map at least, uh, using recombination data. So Alfred Sturdivant, who was one of Morgan's students, he constructed what we call a genetic map, which is an ordered list of the genetic loci among a particular chromosome. Sturdivant predicted that the farther apart two genes are, the higher the probability that a crossover will occur between them, and therefore the higher the recombination frequency. So you can also have a linkage map, and that's a genetic map of a chromosome based on recombination frequencies. So the distance between genes can be expressed as map units, and one map unit, or centimorgan, represents a 1% recombination frequency. Map units indicate the relative distance and order, but not precise locations of genes. So if you look here, the gene B in CN has a 9% frequency. Oh, I'm sorry. It has a 9% frequency, as you can see here. It's a 9.5% frequency between CN and VG, but B and VG have a 17% recombination frequency. Genes that are far apart on the same chromosome can have a recombination frequency near 50%, and such genes are physically linked, but genetically unlinked, and behave as if they were found on different chromosomes. Sturdivant, he used his recombination frequencies to make linkage maps of fruit fly genes, and he used methods like chromosomal banding, um, and then geneticists can use these methods to develop cytogenetic maps of chromosomes. And a cytogenetic map indicates the position of genes with respect to chromosomal features. So, here is an example. If you have, you can have, um, here is the allele, and it shows you on the top and the bottom. It gives you both of the, I guess, the characteristics of each allele. And then the numbers here represent... Um, their position on the chromosome. So 0 here would be the first position, and 104 would be the last position. And then these numbers here indicate relatively where, the, where these alleles are located compared to this very first allele here. Okay, if we alter a chromosome number or a structure, we can get some genetic disorders, as we did in our the karyotype lab we were just talking about the other day. So large-scale large scale chromosomal alterations in humans and in other mammals often lead to spontaneous abortions, miscarriages is what we would call them, or cause a variety of developmental disorders. And actually, 50% of all fertilizations end in spontaneous abortions. Plants, however... Um, are much better at dealing with genetic changes to the number of chromosomes or the structure of chromosomes. Uh, they're much more prepared for that than animals. So in humans, uh, non-disjunction, which is when pairs of homologous chromosomes do not separate normally during meiosis, can result in um, a chromosomal disorder. For example, in Down syndrome. So as a result, we've got one gamete that receives two of the same type of chromosome and another gamete that receives no copy. So this here shows you how these chromosomes have one set, or I'm sorry, these gametes here have one set, normal set, plus an additional chromosome. These are lacking one chromosome. So you can see these all should have two chromosomes, because right here, these two gametes on the right-hand side represent what a normal gamete would look like. Aneuploidy is when fertilization or results from the fertilization of gametes in which, which non-disjunction has occurred. So aneuploidy is a, a uh, I guess I would say a deviation from the normal. So you can be monosomic, meaning having only one chromosome at the locus, or you can be trisomic, meaning you're having two, two chromosomes at a, I'm sorry, it, well it would be three because you would have two in the gamete and when it would recombine you would end up with a third, um, a third chromosome at that particular chromosome number. Polyploidy on the other hand is a condition in which an organism has more than two complete sets of chromosomes and this most often occurs in plants but animals can't typically tolerate it. Um, polyploids are more normal in appearance than aneuploids. So aneuploids will have some kind of abnormality at a particular chromo chromosome number, 
whereas polyploids will either have a they will have an entire set of chromosomes or perhaps two sets of chromosomes in addition to what they are used to. So triploidy is three sets of chromosomes and tetraploidy is four sets of chromosomes. And you can compare and contrast these with the words that you already know that relate to these triploidy and tetraploidy, which would be haploid and diploid. Haploid having one set, diploid having two sets of chromosomes. Chromosomes themselves can also have alterations to their structures, which can lead to different, um, different types of conditions or diseases. So you can have a deletion in which a portion of the chromosome is actually removed, or a duplication where a portion of the chromosome is repeated. You can have an inversion where the orientation of a particular segment within a chromosome is reversed, or a translocation, which we saw a lot in the karyotype lab that we did, where one segment of a chromosome is actually attached to another chromosome. So here are visuals of each of those four types. I encourage you to pause and take a look at these. There are many human disorders that can be due to chromosomal alterations. So um, aneuploidy appears to upset the genetic balance less than others. Um, and so sometimes the individual will survive to birth and even beyond birth having an abnormal chromosomal numbers. And usually individuals that survive have a set of symptoms or a syndrome that are characteristic of the type of aneuploidy. So Down syndrome, which, we, which I mentioned previously, was trisomy 21, meaning that there are three chromosomes, or three copies of chromosome 21 present um, in a karyotype of an individual with Down syndrome. And this affects one out of every 700 children that are born in the United States. And as the age of the mother increases, so does the frequency of Down syndrome. We can't really explain this. We've just noticed it over years. So here's a picture of a child with Down syndrome. And if you look here at the 21st chromosome, you can see that there are three copies, but the rest of the karyotype is normal. Uh, aneuploidy of sex chromosomes resulting from non-disjunction can produce a variety of different conditions. So there's a condition called Klinefelter syndrome that results um, uh, from having an extra chromosome in a male, which produces an XXY, or monosomy X, which is also called Turner syndrome, produces X0 females, meaning they only have one X syndrome, and they're sterile. It's the only known um, viable monosomy in humans, so it's the only one that we know of, the only condition we know of in which a human can have one chromosome um, and survive. One chromosome, one copy of one chromosome and survive. Um, Sam Rhine, who is um, a geneticist from, I want to say the University of Illinois, but I'm not certain about that. He has seen in his 40 or so years of studying, um, of studying genetic disorders, Turner syndrome and Klinefelter syndrome once or twice. They're, these are very, very rare conditions. Uh, there's also a, a condition called, I, I don't know how you would say that in French, but what it results in is something, it, it translates to cry of the cat. And this is a specific deletion in chromosome number five. So a child that's born with this syndrome is mentally retarded and has a cat-like cry. And usually these individuals will die in their infancy or in early childhood. And then there are other cancers like CML or chronic myelogenous leukemia, which are caused by translocations of chromosomes. And again, these we studied in our cancer and loss of the cell cycle. Lab. There are two normal exceptions to Mendelian genetics. And in both cases, the sex of the parent contributing an allele is a factor in the pattern of inheritance. So one of them is genomic imprinting. So for a few mammalian traits, the phenotype is going to depend on which parent passed along the alleles. And such variation in the phenotype is called genomic imprinting. This usually involves the silencing of genes that have been stamped with a type of imprint during gamete production. So for example, we have these mice. And here we have this expressed paternal chromosome with this IGF2 allele. And here's a maternal chromosome where the IGF2 allele is not expressed. Now, this individual uh, 
both of these individuals would be normal sized wild type mice. Um, in heterozygotes, if you had a normal IGF2 allele expressed and a mutant IGF allele, which is not expressed, you, you would end up with a normal type mouse. And in this case, the gene would be inherited from the mother. However, if the gene is inherited from the father, the result is that the mutant IGF2 allele is expressed and the normal IGF2 allele is not expressed, which would result in a dwarf-sized mouse. So it appears that this imprinting is a result of what is called methylation. So the addition of a, meth of a methyl group, or CH3, um, of cysteine nucleotides. So the methyl group attaches to those cysteines. Genomic imprinting is thought to affect only a small fraction of mammalian genes, but most imprinted genes are critical for embryonic development. And then there's another exception to Mendelian genetics, and that would be non-nuclear inheritance. Nuclear referring to the nucleus, non-nuclear referring to not in the nucleus. So this would be the inheritance of the genes that exist within organelles. For example, mitochondria, chloroplasts, and other plastids, which are, if you recall, um, organelles which carry DNA. So there are, uh, we call these genes extranuclear genes, or sometimes cytoplasmic genes, Excuse me, and they're found in organelles that are within the cytoplasm. These extra nuclear genes are inherited maternally, uh, and that's because the zygote cytoplasm comes from the egg. If you consider the size of the egg versus the size of the sperm um, in meiosis, remember that the egg takes, remember only you get one egg for every uh, cycle of meiosis and all of the cytoplasm goes to that one egg, whereas when sperm is developed, all four sperm are viable and there's relatively very little cytoplasm for each of those sperm. So the first evidence of extranuclear genes came from studies on the inheritance of yellow or white patches on leaves of otherwise green plants. And we, we think of this as variegation. There are some defects in mitochondrial genes that can prevent cells from making enough ATP and it can result in diseases that affect both the muscular and the nervous systems because both of those systems require ample amounts of ATP to function properly. So two examples would be mitochondrial myopathy and Leber's hereditary optic neuropathy. So as you can see, um, heredity is extremely complex and we like to simplify things as scientists so that we can make models to predict how certain genes will be inherited but there are plenty of factors outside the patterns of normal inheritance and probability that can impact which genes, uh, which traits are actually inherited and expressed by offspring.